In, in, indeed. I mean, I had a, a good run, a very good run as a stand-up comedian, but it requires you, if that's how you're going to make your living, it's almost like being a bar band. You know, you've got to be on the road 40 weeks a year. And when my kids were born, I, I wanted to experience, you know, being a father and, and uh, being responsible like a father and being home. And, and so I segued into writing uh, exactly the TV shows you just mentioned. And then from the success of those, I was able to then do some of my own projects, uh, mostly, as you pointed out in the introduction, some award-winning documentaries, a couple of screenplays that got uh, optioned, if not made. And in Hollywood, that's, that's good enough to make you a star. Now, this is the Robert Davi Show. I'm guest host Thaddeus Mercado. We're talking to comedian, writer, author, commentator, and all-around renaissance man, Evan Sayet. Evan, what are some of the documentaries you have written and produced, and where can people see those? Well, my, my, my personal favorite was one. Now, you got to remember back in, in, in the 80s, Fox Television had a whole series of documentaries with names like When Animals Attack. Well, I wanted to write a documentary, and I not only wrote it, I, I, I produced it, uh, about my own era, about the 70s, about when I was growing up and coming of age. And so I desperately wanted to call it the 70s, when decades attack. But they wouldn't let me. <laughs> and since it was their money, they won, and it ended up being called the 70s, from bell bottoms to boogie shoes which was the single most viewed, let me, let me try to get this right, the single most viewed special in Discovery Channel's history for about 10 years until it was finally overtaken by a documentary about midgets. <laughs> so, Evan, <laughs> there's no accounting for taste. But, well, you, Evan, when you... you know, it, it was a perfectly fine documentary and a perfectly fine subject. Uh, it's just I, I liked being number one. Um, and, and so for 10 years, it was a pretty good run, it's especially, you know, it's been a double-edged sword how, how eclectic my career has been because I've written and directed all or starred in virtually every medium you could imagine. And this has been something that's been a blessing in the sense that I'm able to do what I want to do when I want to do it. See, if you're a screenwriter, your next idea better be a screenplay or there's nothing you can do. You know, if, if right. you are a playwright, your next idea better be a play. If you're a novelist, your next idea better be a novel. Uh, but because I'm able to write in all of these various media, um, I can come up with whatever idea, and if I really love it, I'm able to do it. The downside of being so eclectic is that you never become the guy in any one of those you know, micro fields. If you want a screenplay, you go to the screen, screenwriter, William Goldman. If you want a documentary, you go to Ken Burns. And, and so... It's, it's been a blessing in that I've seen so many of the things that I believe in come to fruition. Uh, on the other hand, it, it never puts me in the position where I'm the go-to guy for that project. Uh, this is the Robert Dobby Show. I'm your guest host, Thaddeus McCotter. We're talking to Evan Sayet. Evan, it's very difficult to be a generalist in an age of, uh, shall we say, expertise and niche, um, uh, niche talents. But... Nevertheless, you still have, as like you said, a very broad and varied career. But with your original passion, your original uh, genre of stand-up comedy, we've seen incredible amounts of pressure brought to bear on comedians these days, such as Dave Chappelle and others. And, and what do you have to say about that? Well, obviously, first and foremost, it's incredibly unfortunate because because the art of stand-up comedy is, by definition, politically incorrect. Yeah. With stereotypes and exaggerations and hyperbole. And, and so if, if you are never allowed to step out of bounds, there's simply not going to be any such thing as humor. The other reality is that it's always been humor. It's always been the jester who's been able to speak the truth to power. You know, you go back to Shakespeare's plays and, and certainly prior to that, and it's always the, 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 the court jester who is speaking the ultimate truth. Uh, and, and thus, once they've taken away that avenue, which is a little bit of medicine with some sugar, uh, we're we're in a pretty bad place as a society because there's nothing else to fill that void.
So in, in many ways, isn't it true, Evan, that you have humorless people that are trying to impose themselves to silence dissent, silence comedians, precisely because, as you say, they speak truth to power and have done since the age of Shakespeare. So how, how can we reach, how do we reach a point? And we will get into this later, talking about your book, The Woke Supremacy, but it is amazing that we've reached a point where individuals are saying that comedy can be humorless. I mean, the whole point of comedy is to be funny. In, in, indeed, and unfortunately, prior to Chappelle and prior to what is this new blowback, and there is a new blowback, uh, there were, there really wasn't very much comedy out there, and certainly not from the political comedians, uh, i.e. I. the late-night talk show hosts, who had simply replaced humor with vitriol, simply saying something nasty about their political opponents is what qualified as a monologue joke. And it's exactly the reason that at a certain point I got out of writing monologues for these people, uh, not, not because necessarily they wouldn't hire me knowing my politics, but because I didn't want to write for them knowing their politics. And it's not even their personal politics, but how, how, do you, how do you spend your days writing things you don't believe in and then at night fight for what you do believe in? And so continuing to, to write for these shows was just simply something I never even tried to do. Well, in short, isn't it true, Evan, that they've replaced comedy for ideology, and in the oh, end, what you get are just like angry people talking on TV. In, 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 indeed, uh, there's theirs is an angry ideology. It's not just ideology; it is their ideology in particular, uh, whose stock in trade is is anger, bitterness, jealousy, and and uh, unfortunately, bitterness, anger, and jealousy do not bode well. Uh, you know, for a comedic outcome. This is the Robert Davi Show. I'm your guest host, Thaddeus McCotter. We're talking to Evan Sayet, a comedian, author, writer, commentator, and all-around Renaissance man. What I want to get into next is your conservative awakening, because you've been very out there as, as a leading light in the conservative movement. I want to talk about how that worked, how you came to that uh, crossroads, how you may made the transition, and and more importantly, what your take is on today on the very people who are attacking comedy, entertainment, and all other aspects of American life. This is The Robert Davi Show. We'll be back with Evan Sayet. I'm Al Simon, 91 years young. I created Balance 7 20 years ago. At 67, I went to see the doctor for the first time in my life and found out that I had medical problems. He told me that was normal for my age. I don't believe God intended us to be sick and old. I decided to find something to bring my health back. For 10 years, I studied pH and how important it is to the human system. Balance 7 gave me back what I lost by getting older. I no longer get out of bed with a joint discomfort. Balance 7 can do for you what it has done for me and many others. In three days' time, you'll feel more energy, less joint discomfort, and clarity of thinking. No doctor or hospital can do what Balance 7 can do for you. Balance 7 is the key to unlocking the healthy immune system. Bring your body back to balance. Order now. Receive free shipping with the code word AL. Go to balance7.com. That's balance7.com. Order now and get your free shipping and a free gift with your order. Go to balance7.com. Use the code word AL. For the getaway of your dreams, come to Hawaii's playground, Kaanapali Beach Resort, on the fun side of Maui, where the world comes to play. Find your spot on Kaanapali Beach with three miles of white sand, 12 resort properties, two golf courses, and two shopping centers. Enjoy the playground of Hawaii's ancient royalty. Kaanapali Beach Resort is Hawaii's original master planned destination resort and home of the Hawaii Food and Wine Festival. With views of two neighbors, Bring Islands, you can breathe in the land's natural beauty from your favorite resort or golf fairway. Come experience Kanapali's own special brand of Hawaiian hospitality with world-class dining, relaxing resorts, water sports, and activities of every kind. For romantic, family, and great friend getaways, discover the options of Kanapali Beach Resort, where the world comes to play. Plan your getaway today. Visit kanapaliresort.com. That's K-A-A-N-A-P-A-L-I resort.com. The smartest way for you to get the lowest prices on your plane tickets, domestic or international 
International is to call Smart Fares first or last, but you've got to call us before you book your plane tickets. Fly anywhere in the world, fly anywhere in the U.S., and Smart Fares can save you up to 75% on your plane tickets. We have the lowest airline ticket prices on over 500 airlines, and you've got a great 12-hour free cancellation window. Plus, with our live agent help, you can always get fast help and fast answers. So on your next trip, maybe today, maybe tomorrow, how about right now? Pick up your phone and call Smart Fares. Plus, save up to 75% in your plane reservation. So call right now. 800-915-2644. Robert Davi. You know, I'm the one delivering the message, not receiving it. Uh, welcome to the Robert Davi Show. I'm your guest host, Thaddeus McCotter, a recovering politician. With us today is Evan Sayet. Evan is a stand-up comedian who's also written for television. He's also written and produced award-winning documentaries. He's an avowed conservative. He once gave a speech to the Heritage Foundation, which I'd like to discuss with him which Andrew Breitbart called one of the most five most important conservative speeches ever given. He's also been an advisor to Ted Cruz, has written speeches for President Trump, and he is the author of the best-selling Woke Supremacy, which we will also talk with Evan about. Evan, what led you to become open about your conservatism? Well, let's, let's start with the fact that I did not grow up a conservative necessarily. Um, I was born in New York City. I'm a Jew. I'm a Jew in the entertainment industry. And and so as as our friend Andrew Breitbart would have would say, Democrat was simply the default factory setting for somebody born into my demographics. You know, growing up and, and even well into to my adulthood in Hollywood, um uh, I I knew basically what Democrats know. I knew that Democrats are good and Republicans are evil. You know, I'm good, so I must be a Democrat. Democrats like peace. Republicans like war. It's good for business. I like peace. I must be a Democrat. You know, Democrats like air. Republicans don't breathe air or something. I don't know, but I like air, so I, I, I must be a Democrat. What changed me, you know, for in, in shorthand, you could say it was post-9-11. But it wasn't even the attacks of 9-11. Those didn't surprise me. All right. Obviously, I didn't know the dates. I didn't know the target. The, the amount of carnage literally sickened me. But even then, even as a brain-dead liberal, I knew just enough about the world to know that the same people who were murdering the Jews of Israel for no other reason than that they were the closest infidels, who were murdering Hindus in India for no other reason than they were the closest infidels, who had only then recently murdered children in Beslan, Russia, for no other reason than that they were the closest infidels, would, when they could figure out a way over those giant oceans, come and get the big infidel, the great Satan. Of course they would. So the attacks of 9-11 didn't surprise me. But what did surprise me were the days, the weeks, the months, and now the years after 9-11 and the liberal response to the attacks. The idea that we deserved them, that they were, in the words of, of President Barack Obama's spiritual mentor, Jeremiah Wright, the chickens coming home to roost, and that the way to prevent further attacks was to be nicer to the terrorists. But this, 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 this was insane to me. And so for the first time in my life, I had to think about what I believed. I mean, if this is what liberals believe, then, then, then maybe I'm not a liberal. And, and I have an expression. The first time you think is the last time you're a Democrat. And so is- I went out, <laughs> I went out and I searched, you know, I Google searched uh, for the nearest Republican Party gathering, you know, the Republican club, expecting to disagree with them on every single issue across the board, except one. They were willing to fight Islamic fascism. And it didn't matter to me what somebody believed about abortion if you were dead. It didn't matter, you know, what you believe about 
illegal immigration if you're dead. And so I went to my very first Republican meeting, and when I got there, I discovered something. I heard something that I had never once heard amongst Democrats. I heard people who could intellectually, articulately argue in the affirmative for what it is they believe. Democrats don't argue in the affirmative. They say, well, of course we've destroyed your cities. Of course we've destroyed your schools. Of course we've destroyed the border. Of course we've destroyed the culture. But hey, look over there. It's a Nazi. And, and so for the first time in my life, I started to, to move uh, from, first from a reluctant Republican to, to a staunch Republican and then to a reluctant right winger to a staunch right winger. And, and the truth is I'm not even such a right wing fanatic as I am an anti left wing fanatic. And, and as much as I would despise uh, white supremacists, if I, if I ever ran into one, uh, they, they, they are few, they are fringe, and they are rejected. But the, the extremists on the left are many, they're mainstream, and not only this. And, and, and so I realized that I have to not only embrace uh, the conservative values, but I have to fight for them. And so I made the decision to, for the first time in 15 years, I put together a stand-up act, only this time recognizing our side didn't have a Bill Maher for the right, that we didn't have a John Stewart for the right, that we didn't have a, uh, who am I leaving out, Jimmy Kimmel for the right. I intentionally created an act that, that rendered me, that made me, that weaponized <laughs> for, for all intents and purposes, just as their acts are weaponized, I weaponized my own act. Then I put together a show. I called it Evans Say It's Right to Last, a night of conservative comedy. And, and that ran for a very, very long time. And did this then help instruct your legendary speech at the Heritage Foundation, Evan? Well, it was concurrent with, at the same time that, because when you put together a new act, you know, you need to do, put in your time, too. You need to perfect the wording, you need to take it out, you need to do the equivalent of open mic nights. And while I was doing that, I, I was also putting together a unified theory of why it is, because I, I recognized that it wasn't just Islamicism that saw the Democratic Party siding with it. I, I saw a pattern where the Democrats would literally side at every turn with, with, with evil over good, wrong over right, ugly over beautiful, profane over profound, and failure over success. And, and it didn't satisfy me to say simply that anybody who votes Democrat is evil, because I knew too many people. I had friends, relatives, colleagues who I knew weren't evil. And, and, and so and I, it didn't satisfy me to simply say, well, they're just incredibly stupid. For one thing, if they were incredibly stupid, they'd be right every once in a while. There is something about this ideology of leftism today that leads good, smart, decent people to reject fact and reason, and in doing so, side only and always with evil, failure, and wrong. And, and as I was perfecting the stand-up act, I was also perfecting that talk. And interestingly, or ironically, or coincidentally, they came to fruition at about exactly the same moment. I was asked to give my stand-up comedy speech, my stand-up, at uh, CPAC, and the next day I was to speak at the Heritage Foundation. Now, I expected, because my, my stand-up was delivered to every influencer in the conservative movement, I spoke at the Ronald Reagan dinner, the big dinner in front of all of the big mockety mucks. I thought that was what was going to propel me to, to, to fame and recognition in this regard. Unfortunately, it was a fiasco. <laughs> the microphone didn't work. Nobody could hear me. The people in the back of the room who couldn't hear me started talking, so the people in front of them started talking, so the people in front of them started talking. I mean, it, it, was, it was just, it, it, there's no other word. It was, it was, it was an absolute fiasco. And the this is the Robert Davi Show. We're Okay. This is the Robert Davi Show. It was a hard break, Evan. We're talking with Evan Say It. We're going to go back, talk about the Heritage Foundation, legendary speech, and the woke supremacy, his chart topping book.
Attention real estate investors. Do you need cash immediately? If you own one or multiple rental properties, you can use your equity to get cash out fast. The best part is we don't need tax returns or even a good credit score. At America's Loan Source, we are not a bank and we don't have bank rules. We make the decisions to loan you money and there's no limit how much we can give you. Some clients have gotten as much as $500,000 or more within days. Use the money any way you want if you own one rental property or a hundred and COVID has left you in a cash crunch we can help you turn your equity into fast cash call now for details and close in as little as 10 days and get the cash you need 800-353-1760 800-353-1760 800-353-1760 that's 800-353-1760 you order a glass of your favorite Cabernet, fresh asparagus, hollandaise on the side, a filet, medium rare. You unfurl your napkin with a flare, close your eyes, and prepare to listen. Ah, there it is. The sweet music you long to hear. The sizzle. The sizzle of a Ruth's Chris steak. The most magnificent corn-fed prime beef, broiled to perfection at 1,800 degrees. Some call it a sizzle. We call it an anthem. As the waiter approaches, you think, is this one mine or that one? Ruth's Chris Steakhouse. Like Ruth always said, life's too short to eat anywhere else. Make a reservation online at rootschris.com or by calling 800-544-0808. If Ernest Hemingway was alive today, would he say this to you? Shakespeare, Mark Twain, Edgar Allan Poe, all great writers. And after reading your book, I simply must add you to the list. Wait, you don't have a book yet. So make a free call to Page Publishing. Their expert staff can help you turn your book idea into a real book, a masterpiece that could someday make the bestseller list in hard copy and digitally all across the world. Page Publishing can help you completely take your idea for a book, write it, and publish it. So if you want to join the ranks of some of the most famous authors in the world, call now for a free information kit. Turn your book idea into publishing gold. Make a free call right now to Page Publishing. 800-378-3212. 800-378-3212. 800-378-3212. That's 800-378-3212. What are you going to do with your old car? You can try selling it. You could junk it. Or you could donate it to Heritage for the Blind. Your car will be towed away for free, and your donation is tax deductible. Just call 1-800-785-9618. Heritage for the Blind accepts cars, vans, trucks, and boats. It doesn't matter if your vehicle runs or not. It will be towed away for free, and you'll be supporting those that need help. Heritage for the Blind is a nonprofit organization that helps the visually impaired live fuller lives. Call right now to donate your car, and as a special thank you for calling, you'll receive a free three-day vacation voucher to many exciting locations. Call Heritage for the Blind right now, 1-800-785-9618. Donating is easy, and your vehicle is towed away for free. Plus, you'll get a free vacation voucher. Call now, 1-800-785-9618. That's 1-800-785-9618. The Robert Dobby Show. I'm Dwayne Robinson, LAPD. I'm in charge here. Not anymore. Hi, welcome to the Robert Davi Show. I'm your guest host, Thaddeus McCotter. We've been talking with Evan Sayet, comedian, writer, writer and direct writer and producer of award-winning documentaries. We were talking before the break about your legendary heritage speech, and we got cut off right before we got there. Evan, tell us about that heritage speech. Okay, well, just to pick up from before the break. Uh, I, I had expected the night before when I spoke and I did my stand-up comedy at, at CPAC, you know, the, the 
unofficial official gathering of all important conservatives, at least back then it was, uh, and I was speaking at the big event, and it was a fiasco. So now it's the next day, and I basically cross the street, and, and I address a room of uh, a half-empty room of eggheads, uh, and, and I give them this talk in which I lay out what event of liberalism. What I did, the reason this talk went so insanely viral, I mean, it, it, there was a point early on when National Review Online posted a bulletin that said, this talk from Evan Sayet, and they linked to it, this talk from Evan Sayet is cramming our inboxes. Please stop sending it. Because everybody, and keep in mind that, as, as you well know, everybody Everybody in Washington has a, a theory and has an angle and has you know, the reason that this 47 minutes rather wonkish talk to a half empty room went so insanely viral was because I answered a question that, that, that bothers us on our side. As I said earlier in, in our conversation, it's really not satisfying to simply dismiss everybody who votes Democrat as, as being evil. And it's not satisfying to, to simply dismiss everybody who votes Democrat as simply stupid. There has to be a good, smart reason that so many people reject fact and reason and in doing so end up on the wrong side of every issue. And I was able to explain that in a way that was so clear, so satisfying, uh, so elegant, and so uh, undeniable that, that people who after a minute or two of watching a video, turn it off. Watch this 47-minute talk repeatedly. And Evan, what was the what was your finding in that speech that made it so compelling? You know, when when I gave the talk, tens of thousands of them. There was this phrase that kept popping up, I'd say maybe 20 different times. This is an unusual phrase that people kept saying. They kept saying, do you realize what you have there? You've got the unified field theory of liberalism. Once you understand what I said in that talk, you understand the answer to the question that, that I posed earlier. And so when I turned it into a book a few years later, The Kindergarten of Eden, How the Modern Liberal Thinks, I actually laid it out as a scientific formula. And so there are four laws and three corollaries to the unified field theory of liberalism. And for our purpose, I'm just going to give you the first two. I'm going to mm -hmm. give it to you how it's written in the book, and then I'll explain. The first law of the unified field theory of liberalism is that the modern liberal, that's anybody born after World War II and getting worse with each successive generation, the modern liberal was raised to believe that indiscriminateness – is a moral imperative because its opposite is discrimination. That in, in the 1980s, by no coincidence, when the first babies born after World War II, who had become the children of the 60s, when they became the powers that be in academia and education, in uh, news and entertainment, now in social communications, in the 1980s, thinking was for all intents and purposes outlawed. It was deemed by these new powers to be a hate crime. The thinking behind the outlawing of thinking is this. Anything that you believe, anything that I believe, anything that anybody believes is going to have been so tainted by your personal prejudices, prejudices we all have, we can't help but have just for, because we're human beings, prejudices based on things like the color of your skin, the nation of your ancestry, your height, your weight, your sex, and so on. Anything that you believe is going to be so tainted by your personal prejudices that the only way not to be a bigot was to never think at all. That's the first law, and that only gets us halfway there, because if okay. people if people don't think if they're indiscriminate, you would think sometimes they'd be right, sometimes they'd be wrong. Most of the time, they fall somewhere in the middle. Why is it that the Democrat side always was wrong? And that's in the second law of the Unified Field Theory of Liberalism. Again, I'll give it to you as it's written in the book, and then I'll explain. Mm -hmm. Indiscriminateness of thought does not lead to indiscriminateness of beliefs. In 
process of thought leads only and always deciding what evil over good, wrong over right, ugly over beautiful, profane over profound, and failure over success. Why? Because if nothing, if no person, no culture, no religion, no form of governance, no familial construct, if no body shape, if no body size, if nothing is better than anything else, then success is unjust. Why should a person, a nation, a religion, a culture, why, uh, an athlete, why, why should somebody succeed if they're not better than anything else? For the same reason, but only in the inverse, failure, as proved by nothing other than the fact that it has failed, serves as proof positive to the indiscriminate that somehow the failure has been victimized. And then just by extension... If success and failure is proof of injustice, then great success and great failure is proof positive of great injustice and exceptional success and exceptional failure proves the most exceptional injustices of all, which is why the two nations the Democrat hates most in the world is not China it's with, with its concentration camps, it's, it's Israel and the United States. Now, there is no moral, intellectual, religious, diplomatic. There is no argument to be made that America and Israel are the worst nations on the planet. But what they are are the most successful nations on the planet. And to the indiscriminate, success is the only barometer of injustice. This is the Robert Davi Show. We're talking with Evan Say it Now, Evan, would this then also in help lead to your... Very successful book, The Woke Supremacy. A lot of because a lot of what you're saying resonates <laughs> resonates right now. Oh, in, in, indeed. And this is the woke supremacy is an unintended but nonetheless very real sequel to the kindergarten. What happened was the modern liberals still at least had some cultural and perhaps familial connection to the last of the great generations. But over the subsequent years between the writing of the two books, as the last of the great generations first uh, retired and now have moved on from this earth for the most part, that countervailing force of morality and decency and goodness uh, is, is no longer part of the modern liberal's life. And so they've ossified and, and, and uh, metastasized into an even worse uh, incarnation of what I earlier described. Uh, and now they have the power to enforce their, their, their ideology. So in, in a certain way, in, in some sense then too, is it your unified theory, which you put forward, it's kind of turning in on itself and leading to some very strange, very strange incongruous behavior because they're basically at, intellectually at odds with themselves. Um, intellectually requires one to engage in intellectualism. It requires one to think. Indiscriminateness it, it does not allow them to think. Therefore, they cannot recognize their own shortcomings, uh, their own hypocrisies, and their own, in fact, evils. And, and, and so while it is so obvious to us that they are, they are hypocritical and ultimately self-destructive, it's not obvious to them in the slightest. If I, if I can't sell, we'll be back with Evan Sayet talking more about his book, The Woke Supremacy, His Unified Theory of Liberalism, and also upcoming projects. This is The Robert Davi Show. We will be back. Have you heard about vine to bar chocolate? It's the winemaker's chocolate, the world's first chocolate made with well vined Chardonnay Mark from the beautiful coastal vineyards of North America. Gently pressed grapes are harvested after juicing, dried, and finely milled and carefully blended into the finest dark chocolate. 
The Chardonnay Mark contains highly beneficial grape nutrients, flavanols, and has a natural sweetness that flavors the luscious dark chocolate. Mouthwatering, flavorful, delectable dark chocolate goodness with Chardonnay sweetness and beneficial nutrients. And it's alcohol-free, too. It's Vine to Bar Chocolate. Order some today at vinetobar.com. That's V-I-N-E-T-O-B-A-R.com. Cold ship to your door, it's Vine to Bar. Vine to Bar Chocolate. Visit us at vinetobar.com. Let's talk about your credit cards. When you first start using them, it's a slow drip. You make charges, then more charges, then bills come, and they keep coming. When you open your statements, the floodgates come pouring in. You realize you have more credit card debt than you can afford and you're barely making the minimum payments. Wouldn't it be nice to make one affordable payment and have all your credit card bills covered? Make this free call and learn our responsible way to get your credit card bills paid and under control. Sponsored by Consumer Education Services, a nonprofit organization. 800-876-3643. 800-876-3643. 800-876-3643. That's 800-876-3643. CESI is not a loan company. The establishment of a debt management plan may adversely affect your credit rating. Non-payment of debt may lead creditors to increase finance and other charges to undertake collection activity, including liquidation. Hi, this is Fred Dwyer talking about my favorite Italian restaurant, Angelo's and Vinci's, at 550 North Harbor Boulevard in downtown Fullerton. It's a fantastic place to celebrate the holidays. Come inside and dine in our Italian town square, complete with our 10-foot Christmas tree. Enjoy our food made from secret family recipes, pasta, chicken, seafood, salads, and our incredible pizza, and our incredible desserts, including my favorite, the tiramisu flown in from Italy. Angelo's and Vinci's is the perfect spot for your holiday dinner or party. Get your shopping done for everyone by purchasing holiday gift certificates. Feel the spirit at Angelo's and Vinci's, 550 North Harbor Boulevard in Fullerton. Call 714-879-4022 or visit angelosandvinci's.com. Robert Davi. Another $80 million write-off. I guess it's time to start turning overhead. This is the Robert Davi Show. I'm your guest host, Thaddeus McCotter. With us today is stand-up comedian, television writer, producer, and writer of award-winning documentaries, and including... The book, The Woke Supremacy, we're talking with Evan Sayet. Now, Evan, when we were talking about the woke supremacy as well as your unified theory of liberalism, I think you're absolutely right. What you reach is a certain point is when you try to discuss policies with people, what you get are cognitive dissonance, you get projection, and in the end, what you get are emotional responses because I think as the title of your book, The Woke Supremacy, what kind of kind of intuits is the fact that they're not discussing policies with you. They consider those attacks on their person, don't they? Indeed. And I, I think even more to the point is, is the title of the previous book, The Kindergarten of Eden, How the Modern Liberal Thinks, in that once once you have eliminated discriminating thought, uh, the, the utopia they seek to create is, is, is that of the kindergarten classroom. And in the kindergarten classroom, every child gets, uh, every child gets a cookie. Uh, every, every child gets a check mark and a star. Uh, their feelings are more important than the facts. Uh, and, and, and you see that that is exactly the society that these new woke supremacists are trying to create. The irony is, and, and everything about it is, is ironic, because they've ended up being exactly what they seek to eliminate. You see, the, the problem with all the other supremacist movements is, is that they all said that something, a person, a family, a clan, a tribe, uh, a religion, a class, something was superior to everything else. There was a supreme trait. 
This caused every evil the world has ever known from hurt feelings to Holocaust. So the way that this new movement is going to create the perfect world, one not only without Holocaust but even hurt feelings, is by simply decreeing that nothing is better than anything else. But they, they believe that if they can eliminate the judgment, then they can eliminate prejudice. That if they can eliminate discriminating thought, they can eliminate the evils of discrimination. The problem is that to declare everything to be equally good and equally true and equally right is not to fail to make a judgment. To declare that America isn't exceptional is not to fail to make a judgment. It is to have judged America to not be exceptional. So they do make judgments, and in fact, everything they, every argument they make, every judgment they make is prejudged because we know the conclusion of their thinking no matter what. It's going to be that America is not exceptional because if they were to say that it were, they'd no longer be a member of this woke movement. And so they don't believe that they're a supremacist movement. But the definition of a supremacist movement is this. It's one in which the members seek to create a society, first a society, then a world, in which all rights, privileges, protections, and opportunities belong only to those who possess a particular trait, be it a creed, be it a religion, be it a skin color. Well, they do not believe that people who aren't woke should have the right to freedom of speech. They don't believe that people who aren't woke should have the protections of due process. Just look at the Rittenhouse case. They don't believe that people who do not possess the supreme trait of wokeness should have the opportunities to run a, run a business or have a job. So by this good-hearted but naive attempt to eliminate all the evils of the world, they have become exactly what they fear. We're talking with Evan Sayet here at the Robert Davi Show. I'm your guest host, Thaddeus McCotter. Now, in the woke supremacy, you lay all this out, and there, as I take this as good news, it was Amazon's uh, top downloads for all books on political science. That is progress, isn't it? I mean, people are hearing your message, and they are learning about what's at stake here from this authoritarian movement. They are, they are indeed, and, and the good news, Oh, the phone. Their own. Sorry, Evan, your, and, phone, your phone dropped out a little. Evan, I'm sorry about your phone dropped out a little bit, right, when you said the good news. Let's hear no, the good okay. news. <laughs> well, the, the good news is that with such revolutions and supremacist movements, uh, the revolution tends to eat their own. You know, because as anybody who has even a, a, a modicum of intellect and a modicum of morality more and more comes to recognize the evils of the purists, of the supremacists, and attempt to move on, they too must become victims of the supremacist movement. I mean, Leon Trotsky being just you know, the most obvious example of this. Um, and, and so as we're seeing the Dave Chappelle's, and as we're seeing the, the people who in every step along the way were, were, were thought of as cutting edge liberals, now being uh, uh, victimized by the supremacy, they too now have to come over to our side. You know, and at first there, there was a great movement by Brandon Strzok uh, called you know, hashtag walk away. It's, it, for the first step is not to convince people to be conservatives. It's to get them to walk away from the supremacy. And what invariably happens is once they walk away, once they open their eyes, once they begin to think, and once they begin to, to recognize that these evils are now coming down upon them, well, they have no choice but to move further and further into our camp. I mean, this is what happened with, with Tammy Bruce. This is what happened with uh, Bernie Goldberg. Uh, and, and this is what you see happening with uh, Dave Chappelle. And so, it's, and by the way, yeah, go ahead. It, it's what happened with Ronald Reagan back in the day, too. In, in, indeed. But at least back in the day, 
the Democratic Party still was a pro-American party. It was only with the arrival of the radicals of the 60s and then the long march through the institutions in which they took over academia and education, and when they took over news and entertainment, when they took over uh, IT and now social communications, that that party morphed into an enemy of the state. Up until very recently, we all agreed that America was great. The question was, how do you make it greater? And and most of that came with, with, with percentages, you know, for how much, what role should the government play? You know, 10 percent more, 10 percent less. You know, how much should the, the rich be taxed, 5 percent more or 10 percent more or whatever. But now we actually have anybody who is pro-American, pro-Western civilization, and by the way, pro-intellect and intelligence and progress is on the political right with the left being comprised entirely of anti-Americanism. Well, I think you're absolutely right about that. We're talking with Evan Say it, Evan, when you talk about that, you talked about the greatest generation. I remember being able to talk to older members of Congress that were Democrats. We all agreed on one thing that allowed for the governing paradigm to continue, was we agreed America was a great exceptional nation, and the question was, how do you form a more perfect union? And I think you've absolutely hit the nail on the head. You've had an entire wing of the Democratic Party saying America is not great, America is a focus of evil in the world, and that has started to rupture the governing paradigm between the parties, hasn't it? In, 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 indeed it has. And look, it was Mark Rudd, one of the founding fathers of the world supremacist movement. He was one of the 60s radicals. And, and just to give you an idea how evil and mentally ill these people were, at the very first gathering of the terror group, the Weather Underground, they took time out to cheer Charles Manson. They cheered Charles Manson for two reasons. One, because they loved the blood. The, 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 the radical left has always loved blood. But the other reason was because Manson was doing what they were trying to do. If you recall, Helter Skelter, that to an apocalyptic race war. Manson was trying to start a race war, and the radicals were trying to start a race war. And proof of this is twofold. One, when the radicals arrived, and they could have joined with either party, they didn't join with the party of abolition. They didn't join with the party of the 1957 Civil Rights Act. They joined with the party of George Wallace. Right? Then, when the civil rights movement split into two, they didn't join with Martin Luther King, who wanted equal rights. They joined with Malcolm X, who was a black supremacist. Now, what does George Wallace and Malcolm X have in common? Well, it didn't matter to them whether Wallace made whites hate blacks or X made blacks hate whites, just so long as Americans hated each other. Well, Mark Rudd said the true flowering of the 60s will come in the 90s when we've taken over the institutions. Well, he was only wrong because he missed the obvious. Once they'd taken over the institutions, they would need one more generation to use those institutions to create their, not Hitler youth, not Lenin's young pioneers, but their social justice warriors. Well, if it's 30 years from the 60s to the 90s, Bab, what's 30 years from the 90s? 2020. All right. This is why suddenly they no longer hide the reality of who and what they are. They no longer, you know, even just a few years ago, Barack Obama had to use euphemisms. He had to say things like fundamental transformation. Now they don't even hide the fact that they're socialists. They don't hide the fact that they seek to destroy the United States. They don't. And this is why we're seeing the same rhetoric calling cops pigs while we're seeing the violence in the streets. This is the coming of fruition of the 60s radicals uh, who, who, have, who have succeeded in taking over the schools and creating a generation of social justice warriors. And in that regard, it's so we are so lucky to have people like you, Evan, say it with your books, with your documentaries, with your advising uh, presidential candidates, your speech writing for President Trump. Currently at a period of time when, as Robert Davi, when he returns, will be more than happy to tell you, it's very dangerous for conservatives with a cancel culture, especially in the entertainment industry. The people who rightly bemoan the blacklist are now engaging in foisting cancel culture upon people. I just want to thank you on behalf of so many people, Evan, say it, for your courage for putting everything you have on the line to get out your unified theory of liberalism, to put out the woke supremacy, and to stand up for everything that we all believe should be preserved and promoted within our exceptional America. 
Thank you, Evan. This is the Robert Davi Show. We'll be back. The smartest way for you to get the lowest prices on your plane tickets, domestic or international, is to call SmartFares first or last, but you've got to call us before you book your plane tickets. Fly anywhere in the world, fly anywhere in the U.S., and SmartFares can save you up to 75% on your plane tickets. We have the lowest airline ticket prices on over 500 airlines, and you've got a great 12-hour free cancellation window. Plus, with our live agent help you can always get fast help and fast answers so on your next trip maybe today maybe tomorrow how about right now pick up your phone and call smart fares plus save up to 75 percent in your plane reservation so call right now 800-915-2644 800-915-2644 800-915-2644 the Radio Channel.